dignitaries, diplomats, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, indeed great honor that the summit gave me to speak to you on, on, on this occasion of celebrating 100 years of Dr. Norman E. Borlaug, with whom I, has the, I had the privilege uh, of working from the very beginning of my breeding career. Norman and myself, um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just going to tell my practical experience as I worked along with Dr. Borlaug from the very beginning. And um, uh, my observations go all the way from 1969, when I joined his team, until the year 2000, uh, when, when basically he basically began to reside in Texas. I joined his postdoctoral team in 1969, um, and uh, I was already in, in Mexico, I, I believe it was month of April or May, uh, when I arrived by my uh, wife, um, wife and uh, two kids, very young kids, in Mexico without any words of his Spanish language. Uh, we finally settled in, but I remember one thing from the very beginning as a young man. I was only 27 years old, had graduated from University of Sydney in Australia, come briefly to India, worked in team of Dr. Swaminathan at IRI, at that time what they call, had created pool officer team. And the later on when I received the invitation to join CIMIT as a postdoctoral fellow, I felt that the two, three years of experience would be excellent. Well, the two, three years resulted into, until now, residing in Mexico and continuing working 32 years for CIMIT. But he, what, what, what I wanted to tell you, that he had a very short meeting of his technician and the scientist of the WIT program in the office of Lond Londres 40, London 40 in Mexico City. That was the summit's headquarter. Very small meeting in a small room, and he was telling people about the, some of the things in the program. And he looked at me. He singled out me, and he looked at me, and he said he did not like Deadwood. <laughs> and he repeated that in translated linear, he, used, he basically said linear seca. That's Deadwood, translates Deadwood. And you know, I was only 27 years old, and I felt that the, my career is over here. <laughs> and uh, you could believe that. I mean, you you coming from the, just from the academy, uh, where you excited about the science, and you coming in a program highly. Sixty nine. He was not Nobel laureate at that time. Remember, and uh, kind as he was, but he looked at me very that way, and that the two words I have never forgotten. And I keep reminding other people coming to bread with Absemit as well. Uh, Norman was team builder and team creator, bringing various disciplines together. And he had a unique ability, sorting out the dead woods, selecting the best ones, uh, uh, and creating a team. He wanted breeders pathologists, physiologists, agronomists in his program all working together. That was his mission. And he, he just had, he, he couldn't compromise that. And many of us problem with that, you know, a lot of, lot of people have prob problem. He almost fired me in 1976. 
He had appointed him in 1973 as a head of the, uh, the wheat program. His wheat program, he still was the director of program, he appointed in 1976, 1973 as a head of that program. At that time I also felt that I would be fired very soon. And uh, because I know that the previously he had, a, he had appointed other people and they left. They were leaving every year. He wasn't available after 1970 the Peace Prize Awards. He was traveling all over the world. And, uh, and there was a, in 1976, Yaki Bailey was affected by leaf rust and the variety Hupateco. The reason he was very much angry with me, because I was at that time taken vacation in India. And, uh, and here was a disaster going in Mexico, in uh, Yaki Valley. And uh, I came and he said, uh, you shouldn't be out. You, you better go there, okay. Anyway, my, not myself, only Jesse Dubin here, Enrique Torres and many other people, along with the scientists in Mexico, the Mexican authority, they were fighting that battle. Mexico wasn't ready for that epidemic. I mean, Yaki Bailey wasn't, Sonora wasn't. Because the whole concept of the chemical fungicide was just something like, uh, not really, it's, a, it's a something you can do it, okay. But, and so they had to import the chemicals and so and so start doing that. But 1984, we had become good friends. He felt that I could do the job by then, okay. It had taken me almost 15 years to convince me. In 1981, he had retired almost, okay, no. But he keep coming and keep coming here and making sure that the wheat program was run well. And uh, we, uh, we enjoyed. One thing was, Norman could eat every night after night in the morning what they call huevos ranchero, fried eggs, ranch style, and the steak and the tequila in the night, okay. He could do that every night without any failure. And I knew that if I did that way every night, I would be dead. <laughs> you know that what happens, we did not have much, much more awareness of cholesterols and the triglycerides and all those things. It didn't matter. He was a kind of build up, nothing happened to him. And it's a fact. He, his, my opinions and advice to him many times over the years, even he wasn't director, but he was very influential, was a very, very direct, some way he implanted in me directness, honesty and directness. And I was a kid, still kid, came from India, very, very Indian, you know, was supposed to be very obedient to okay. him. And, uh, and uh, he, he felt that uh, uh, that kind of personality here in Mexico, where the, especially in Sonora, where we practiced Wild West, the very Indianness was not acceptable, okay? And he felt that I had to change, and I did change, okay? But when I go to India, I'm very Indian. <laughs> uh, I visited him in my, in 2007, at his Dallas residence, with Dave Warrell, to him he called Tal Gringo. You know, the Gringo, generally Mexican, refers to North American people, Gringo. Uh, Dave Warrell was my postdoctoral fellow with me, and we had become very friends, so when I visited him, I, I felt that I wouldn't be able to locate his home very well, Norman's home. So we, we took him and we went. Dr. Borla, at that, in that visit, we spent four or five hours. Fortunately, that day, two th it, it was year 2007. He was very good shape that day. And he presented a copy of his Congressional Medal to me. And he said, I, I want to keep you. I want to have this, uh, I want to give you this as uh, our friendship. That was a medal was his, you know. U.S. Congressional Medal, a copy. Not as a copy, a small replica, that one. A philosophy, uh, I think in, in Tom's presentation and various other presentations, his philosophy were very well laid out. 
the science philosophy. Uh, I don't want to go very much, except that uh, successfully established shuttle breeding. But uh, yes, he established the shuttle breeding and part to keep it. But the other people failed. And not his main advisor, Dr. E.C. Stackman, but the great breeder of University of Minnesota at that time, Stackman's time, forgetting his name, perhaps my friend uh, Ron can remind us, from my, uh, forgetting his name. He said, Norman, the shuttle breeding is one step forward and two step backward. And Dr. Bola, I almost got fired in 1957 when the Rockefeller Foundation had sent the review. Stackman came to his rescue at that time. But you know, the results by then were very evident on the, on the shuttle breeding. It was, it was Professor Hayes' recommendation. Hayes was his plant breeding professor. I think Hayes. He respected him a lot. Norman telling me that uh, the last days of the Professor Hayes, he visited him to say hello. Only a few, perhaps a year or a few months before he died. He basically said to Norman, Norman, why we missed the shuttle breeding? And then he, of course, he closed his eyes. Norman tried to explain me, ex explain to him, but perhaps it wasn't very, uh, it, it, uh, uh, his uh, uh, did not capture, I believe. Okay, But he wanted to know why, as a great professor at the University of Minnesota plant breeding, was not able to capitalize on the shuttle breeding himself. Borlaug believed in the international testing from the very beginning. He was the first one to conceive this idea, but came out of the 1951 USDA-led International Rust Nursery. 1951, I believe, because the epidemics of stem rust were widespread, not only in the United States, but everywhere. And so he was a great supporter. By 1959, Dr. Bola was running international nursery out of Mexico. And some of this story which Dr. Swaminathan described how the seed went to India that, that goes back to origin in the USDA-led rust nursery. That's where the dwarf foods were there, and that's what Dr. Swaminathan saw in those years. He believed in a very large F2 populations large number of crosses. He was a visionary, you know. He was thinking about the dwarfing genes when he produced the tall wheat. Very tall wheat, the stem rust resistant. Yields were, if they, if they, if they stood, yes, they protected the rust, but the yields were not still spectacular. And when they, they could still large, and if they last, they were still well disastrous. He could see that the central Me Mexican Valley of Bahio, and he could see that here. And, but he was visionary. He felt that in 1949, unless he dwarfed these plants, he's not going to achieve any spectacular. And you have to give tremendous credit on his vision, okay? And that's how he started to look at. He started to find out uh, where he could get the dwarf genes to make this variety shorter. I can go, I, can't, I, can, I can talk to you hours and hours on these things, but I'm not, I haven't got the time. And of course, the stem rest was a paramount. We all the time have said that. I, I dubbed this myself. <clears throat> By the way, I should have clarified this to you. Everything I'm telling, he said that, okay. And many of things, the red one, that's his own words, okay. Norman as wheat coolie. I mean, he was himself a wheat coolie. Coolie, I think, believes the Indian words, words 
which carries the bags on the Indian train station, okay. Norman was like that in the wheat fields. And anybody who worked with him to be part of the team has to be coolie. So I was, I'm also wheat coolie. And so all his friends, any, all his, uh, all his uh, uh, followers have to become wheat pili. He loved, and uh, pulling is not pulling, it should have been P-U-L-L, -E but they changed my, uh, they edited and they put it pulling. That should be pulling. You have two populations, he loved that, okay. And he knew that, he knew that we could cut the heads. And that would be less strenuous on our back. But he wanted 10 hectares of pool, the F2 populations, the very best plant. And the one reason was that he felt he couldn't train the trainees uh, unless you pull the plant. And uh, I argued very much that we don't have to do that. And we couldn't change the methodology until, until, until uh, he had, uh, uh, he had gone to Texas, as a matter of fact. Uh, Rabi Singh has changed further cement methodology, which are other more efficient. Uh, you know, the one thing was to make sure that the postdoctoral worked, and I was post postdoctoral. Uh, he made sure that the, we we were ready to go to wheat field at be six o'clock in the field. The fields you visited yesterday. Those fields were still there. And so he woke up five o'clock and we had to go for breakfast in a cold fish restaurant. Yeah, he called, the restaurant was not cold fish restaurant. But the waiter at five o'clock, what do you expect? <laughs> yeah. This was 24 hours restaurant and the waiters by then were very tired. Uh, it was a waitress as a matter of fact. And he said, he, he, uh, he and Glenn Anderson, myself, and few others who were visiting us, they had to go there all the time. I was driver. And uh, we sat down, whoever's ranchero, nice tortilla, this belly, uh, and uh, in cold fish restaurant. Uh, and because the lady never smiled, so he said it's cold fish restaurant. He was five star general in the front line of battle, and that the battle was wheat plot, plot, okay. He was a general, but he was a soldier at the same time. And that was the great lesson we have to learn. You see, directorship didn't mean anything to him. He spoke with wheat plants, outstanding wheat plants in the F2 generation, were called new bulls. He related the plants in the human terms. I mean, he used to call bulls. Say, pull that bull out, put in the cross in black, and make the damn cross okay. It, they, it got very nice genes, and we got to pull that out. But they, they were called, in his program, new bulls. And everywhere, we generating more bulls than we could handle. But we had to do it. Uh, he had a very special way describing the chromosomes. And nobody had uttered that, that words before on the chromosomes. You recall times and times the two varieties, the Green Revolution varieties, Kalyansona and Sonalika. They were the lead Green Revolution variety, were launched, not only had transformed the production here in the Yaki Valley and Sonora, but they were the varieties of the Green Revolution in India and Pakistan. In Pakistan, it was called Mexipac. Kalyansona, which is the same cross in the Semit uh, Crossing Dictionary, would be called 818156. It was released as Siete Salmon Hills, and then in there was given the baptized as Kalyansona and Sonalika. Remember, only after three, they, this variety helped launch the Green Revolution, but they had become susceptible in the Indian subcontinent, not only to 
leafrust and stem rust, but a devastating disease in those two countries used to be stripe rust, even in those years, okay. He, he asked me, he insisted me that I then fix that Kalyan Sona and Sonalika. Fix that means that uh, I make them resistant, but he put the condition. He was, remember, he was a director, okay. He said that they have to look like the same. You can't just make it different because a farmer shouldn't like it. And uh, okay, uh, we, we can do that. We, we can do that. We made thousands of classes of embalming those varieties, believe me, that's a reality. But uh, the varieties never combine very well, okay. Just sometimes make some classes, then uh, 1,000, 2,000, every year, let the large F2 population going in. And I'm sure he told to Indians and Pakistanis as well that you got to make a lot of classes on these varieties. So and so, okay. He knew that the Green Revolution, continuation of Green Revolution would be defeated unless we fix the rest of it. He knew that very well. I looked at the register of the crossing, which is still restored in the Dr. Ravi Singh's area of the bread with program. He had already made 10,000 crosses himself on those varieties and the lines. And he had not gotten anything. When I made 10,000 crosses, then I went to say, hey, Norman, it looks like um, I'm not getting anything. He said, you know what's happening here? In a very nice way, you know. You know, he said, the chromosomes don't belly up from this variety. You know, very human way of describing the chromosomes don't belly up. I mean, to, to make the, the recombination to occur, many of you understand more genetics than I ever will do, that there have to be recombination, chasma formation, and say so they, they never come together, they go, they sell out, something like that, okay. That's what he said, chromosome don't belly up. And um, he also wanted me to cross the Argentinian variety called Tesanos Pinto Precoz, dubbed, abbreviated TZPP. The variety highly resistant to stem rust, good quality leaf rust, some septoria and so and so, the variety also we used to cross, get nothing. As a matter of fact, Altclad later on dubbed that variety Tesano Pinchi Precoce. Pinchi is a very nasty word in the Mexican language, okay? But the uh, Alt is here somewhere. He the one said, hey, you know, Raj, this is a Pinchi variety, you know? And, uh, and Glenn Anderson called that variety resistant to yield, and that's why he never did that. However, Norman never gave up, okay? That's the same way he said, he believed that we produced the miracle one day. Because he believed that that variety was a wonderful package of the genes. Academia, Dr. Borlaug, you know, um, he felt, this is again in the 70s, early 80s, he believed that the uh, academy were ivory tower research model, perhaps were very much divorced with real agriculture. He also used the word publish in Paris. He wanted to burn all the plant breeding books at that time. And he said so in many places. He said so in presentation in 1972. American Society, of, uh, American Society of Plant Pathology meeting in 1972, he said, you know, you somehow burn these books or feed to cows, okay. He, look, he respected a lot of professors, you know, don't take this, don't, don't take that, that's why it was, okay. Horrible Vogel's name was mentioned. Warren Cranston was great. I have taken mostly the wheat and the barley people, I know that, but I'm sure he respected a lot of people. Kelvin Qualser, who is in the audience, Irwin Watson of Australia, Ralph Calwell, Rasmussen, E.C. Stackman, his own mentor, he respected a lot, okay. 
you know. And he very much, you know, he described, uh, he had a great admiration for Arne Sears, to whom I named, dubbed, based on Norman description, as a Caesar scientist, okay. I was a Caesar, a man who, you can cut the chromosomes the way you want and then tie up wherever you want, okay? That's what Dr. Sears, and I think uh, Perry Gustafson in the audience would agree with me. Dr. Sears had that, he was building the monosomics and disomics, and all kinds of things, but translocations, all kinds of things. Norman had tremendous respect, respect for that. He, he, as far as I remember, there are a lot of people here from Europe and Asia, and I don't want to say that, but he felt that the Europeans were too, too white color, and so it's so the developing countries. In 60s and 1970s, Dr. Borlaug felt that the developing countries, scientists were white color, dressed in suit and tie, ready for marriage party, okay? <laughs> you know? Uh, you know that many of you would agree with me, okay? Uh, it is not so now. He was very understanding with them, okay? But he was very understanding. He changed their dress code by example. Norman never would go to field in tie and coat, okay? Unless, he, he, unless you don't give him time and he, he, he get out of the uh, auditorium address and then right away running to field, he never did that. He went and changed the things and then we went. Uh, I think most of the, he has the most admiration of the great uh, admirers and the disciples from the developing country today. L a lot of you. His views on environment. He, he was reading, he must have been mid-70s, I believe, the book by Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. Great book, I believe, okay. And he was very disturbed because it was a uh, lot of against DDT. Norman believed that the DDT protected the health of the people in the developing country. But he also wanted the Green Revolution. He, I believed, I mean, he has been dubbed anti-environmentalist. And why I wanted to say these things. That's why I brought this issue. He wasn't. However, he believed, because he believed the Green Revolution technology spread in LDC to avoid starvation and hunger, and some compromise, some kind of uh, things has to be done. This is, the, this is the things in 1970s I'm talking about. He wasn't anti-environment. He loved the soils, birds, and especially forest. Dr. Raleigh Sears, yeah, when he visited Oregon State year in and year out, he used to pick him up. Uh, Warren Cross would ask Raleigh Sears to go and pick him up at the airport in Portland. Drove him to the Eastern Oregon, uh, Eastern Oregon, which is a long way. But you got to, th got to pass through forest, okay? Norman would stop, any forest coming, he would stop and he'd start looking at the tree. I've seen him many times. Um, Raleigh described me, I don't know where he, where, where he is in the audience somewhere, or maybe not. But uh, he said that, well, he stopped and many times will stop, he start looking the forest, but two, the trees, you know, in the east tree in the forest for two hours. And never could meet the other, all the arrangement has been made in the eastern Orient for him to receive, the, go and talk to the farmers or people, whatever it was, okay. That's the way he was, okay. Only time I remember in the wheat field, the Yaki Valley here, where you were yesterday, he stopped, I mean, he would stop working in the field when a flock of birds were around. He used to whistle with the birds. He loved the birds. And that's the only time I could get a little bit rest. <laughs> Otherwise, I had to carry the books, I had to take the notes. He all the time uh, talking about the wheat plants, and you got to note that one. And, uh, but he stopped, he hated one bird of Sonora here, of course. They call Chanate, okay. He hated Chanate because Chanate used to destroy his wheat plot. So he always uh, bitching against those birds. But uh, he loved the other birds, okay. The birds who picked the uh, insects or picked the wheat grain from the, from the soil level, which were not sitting on the 
sitting on the wheat plant, the sparrows and all those things, they come and destroy the heads and then you, you know. But I think, you know, he, it's very true. He wasn't anti-environmentalist. He just uh, felt that the we were not ready how to bring that balance at that time. But uh, he, so he had to fight the Green Revolution. GM crops. I strongly believe that he believed in gene revolution. He also believed, you know, he 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 was he was strong believer. He's a strong believer in the transgenic crops. Let me say that very clearly to you. Okay, you know, you like some of the people like other people don't like. Especially environmental people don't like it. But that's the fact. Okay. Uh, he felt that the transgenic was the one, one great leap forward in agriculture. He also believed the bread wheat, you know, the, the great bread wheat to which you're talking about. I've been talking about four or five days here. The, a world staple, a GM equivalent engineered by Mother Nature. You know, it got the three, three distant grasses coming uh, and just put together by Mother Nature, packaged by Mother Nature, okay. Perhaps, if not million, perhaps thousands of years ago, in the same place where in the, in the, in the somewhat eastern Syrian plains, southern Turkey, and perhaps uh, western part of Iraq, where now the heavy and partial battle going on. That's where the, those genes were packaged together, okay, by Mother Nature to make the bread wheat or Western Caspian, whatever you want to believe. A lot of people will say that I'm not right, okay? But uh, I don't care. Uh, he served, you know, uh, on the Yasa board with Clive James, which is basically was the promoting the yeah, agency promoting the GM crops. Food security, go fast. Uh, I'm reminded I've got to go fast, okay? So I better. Uh, he believed food security, populations, control, and the livelihood. Pile up food was his policy. In case of India, he continued to advise Indian government on the unemployment as a major cause of denying decent livelihood to millions. Indian par parliament had passed a bill for food security now. Malnutrition and hunger continue in, despite that. In, in last monsoon, 8 million tons of food grains were rotted. Bureaucracy and corruption have denied grains coming to the poor. Norman would smile today if Parliament bill and Indian Supreme Court dictates were fully in place. I believe he would be very happy to see that. As a humorist, he told us all Mexican dirty jokes. Believe me, I can't tell you, but they, they, he told that, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially when he was in the wheat field, never in the office. Eva Bieska is secretary for a long time. Uh, perhaps he never seen never heard what, uh, what he meant, okay. Uh, he participated with us in gambling for coke. You know, we tossed the coin and see that whether he had never lost that gambling, but he never was drinking coke, as a matter of fact. I had to provide him some chocolate. He had a special ability to describe the wheat plants in human terms. Many times he appeared harsh, and I don't want to, uh, the tears, I don't want to translate that. You ask the uh, Simit colleague there, perhaps they know that. But you art, ask uh, Art Clark, he knows that. But indeed, he was kind, especially to Mexican support staff, undenying that. He could eat, as I said, every day, whoever's ranchero fried eggs, T-bone steak and tequila. I had no problem with that. His arteries were as clean as could be. His doctor always gave him the cleanest bill of health. And I deviated from that diet the latter part of my life, light and honey. And I follow J.C. Dubin's DBT, which is dal, bath, roti, tarkari. Okay. Uh, a first skin chemical review in mid-1970. The review was led by Dr. Ralph Riley of England. Sir Ralph, he died a few years ago. Sir Ralph and Norman, uh, this is a big, uh, perhaps even semi Director General doesn't know what happened that time. They dig disagreed in the first King Kenyal of everything. It was a great battle between, say, like two titans, okay. K 
Keith Pillay in between as a deputy director of research, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't have time, Hans reminder, I got to go, but I, it's a very nice story. Uh, Norman and Icarda, uh, uh, Tom reminded Roland Norman in Icarda. He was the selection committee member to decide the sites, okay. His first preference was, for the Dr. Mahmoud's information, Kamishli. And, but Kamishli is a border town with Turkey, later on Aleppo was selected. He visited Aleppo, I believe, in 2005, right, so 2006, but 2005, his great moment of happiness was meeting this farmer on the photograph, which is only a few kilometers away from the Ikada's headquarters. Uh, this farmer had prospered very well by growing uh, Mexipak variety, the Green Revolution variety he's in. He advised to DG Beltaji was to get rid of all well, they put lazy persons. I didn't say that, okay. I had said web well, bonus because that the word he has used, okay. People who don't work. Norman knew Mahmoud Soleh very well, and he would be happy to see that. He would be, he's not here, that Dr. Soleh was, is navigating Ikada excellently out of Syria. Glenn Anderson, name was mentioned, a Canadian sister, Sister, uh, citizen was the greatest last to CG summit and wheat program when he prematurely died in 1981 at the age of 56. Glenn's names uh, Glenn's was Dr. Bolak's ambassador in India. I have never seen Norman crying, but he cried at Glenn's funeral in Winnipeg. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity.